Uh, no. <laughs> oh, no, that really would have been prudent. Look, I know it's easy to say that the private sector has profited hugely through a combination of consumer borrowing and public spending, but that's only because it's true. <laughs> PFI does throw up a lot of curiosities. In 2001, the government sold off a number of government buildings, now worth a billion pounds, to an offshore property company. Amongst the properties they sold off was the Inland Revenue. The Inland Revenue? <laughs> Nothing important. <laughs> Well, recently, a controlling interest in that property firm has been bought by a New York private equity and hedge fund manager. So, hang on. The Inland Revenue Building is now owned by the manager of a hedge fund. I can't talk about it. <laughs> it's private. <laughs> but there's a twist in the PFI tale. With credit incredibly difficult to find in the current crisis, some PFI deals aren't looking such bargains for the contractor after all, saving the taxpayer from financial exposure. Brilliant. Except, if it does go belly up, as happened with Metronet and the Tube, then the taxpayer foots the bill. And when PFI contractors suffer, investors suffer, and that's often pension funds. So it's a double whammy. Uh, not so brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> but the problem with PFI is the bill doesn't come now, but later, with 30 years of repayments on hospitals and schools and defence. So the rich, who got richer courtesy of banking and the housing boom, become even richer thanks to PFI and pension dealings. Only last month, Lloyd's TSB about to receive five and a half billion pounds of taxpayers' money, joined forces to buy Porterbrook. That was the company that bought Britain's trains off the government for just 73 million pounds in 1996. It was sold later that year for 825 million pounds. And twice since, once for 1.4 billion and now 2 billion pounds. So we just paid 2 billion pounds for a company we sold in 1996 for 73 million pounds. A profit of 2,700%. OK, so you build the school, rent it out to the Education Authority for 30 years, after which you turn it into a hotel. You got yourself a deal. <laughs> I'm prepared to offer you a £50 million contract to run a public service. And for that, I'll put in... Five million pounds for your lawyers. OK, so that's consultancy fees, management fees, accountancy fees, revised contract fees, plus another number, plus another very large number, plus an even larger number, you can't even tell me, <laughs> and a 10% contingency allowance, and that's to maintain my local bus shelter. <laughs> OK, let's do it. OK, here's my offer. I ask you how much profit you're going to make, and in return, you tell me to bugger off of my, my own business. Take it or leave it. As we approach 12 years of Labour government, borrowing is looking dangerously out of control. How much? I owe all that. Northern Rock, Bradford and Bingley, <laughs> bank recapitalisation, liquidity fund, PFI, pensions, inflation, recession, Olympics, departmental budgets. Oh, shit. <laughs> and the tragedy is, you see, while all this was happening, they weren't worried. For ten years, the press celebrated excess. Oh, it was all wonderful. We'd replaced the manifesto with the Sunday Times rich list. And because it was New Labour, we got away with it. People thought it was different. Still, if it's any comfort, in America, the picture's even more alarming. Debt there has now broken the $10 trillion barrier. What does that mean? Well, the first thing it meant was that the debt clock in New York's Times Square ran out of room for the noughts. <laughs> After the bailout of mortgage companies Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, 40% of American mortgages are now underwritten by the government. Likewise, 40% of private pension funds have defaulted and rely on the state. And there's only one way to pay for all this, and that's tax. <laughs> Except there's another paradox, because pretty much anything that can be taxed has been taxed, and any more taxation could reduce productivity and create less, not more, money to spend. And no-one ever won an election by saying they'd raise tax. Well, I might have said that, but, um, by mistake. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's outrageous. Last year, eight of Britain's biggest companies claimed they didn't have to pay anything because their feet were off the ground when they were given the tax bill. <laughs> Several leading British businessmen have called for the government to introduce lower taxes, but some aren't prepared to wait. London's got some of the finest people in the world. I mean, only this year I, I appointed Sir Martin Sorrell as chair of my International Business Council. 
Uh, and, and straight away he's announced he's, he's moving his company to Ireland. Yeah, well, you, well, you, you can't get much more international than that. And, and from there, he can tell people how good Britain is. For the third of the year, you're allowed to live here. <laughs> Look, you can't tax these high earners in the city for the simple reason that if you did, they'd move abroad and ruin someone else's economy. <laughs> but that's ridiculous. I mean, it's, it's bananas. Ah, funny you should mention that. Here's a hand of bananas. Now, for every one pound bunch of bananas in the shops, the figures break down like this. 13 pence to the growing country, 1.5p for labour, 10.5p in costs and 1p in profit. 8p to a Cayman company for use of the purchasing network, profit raised, no tax. 17 pence to Bermuda for use of the distribution network, profit, no tax. 8 pence to Luxembourg for use of financial services. 4p to Ireland for use of the brand, profit, reduced tax. 4p to the Isle of Man for insurance, Profit, no tax. Six pence to Jersey for management services. Profit, no tax. Sold to the UK retailer, that's you and me, Hugh, at a cost, no profit, no tax. The 60p, the retailer sells them on for £1 with a 39p markup for costs, declaring a profit of just 1p. I see, so by keeping all the profit offshore in tax havens, the manufacturer pays no UK tax. And provided it stays there, it remains lawfully tax-free. Exactly. Oh, well, thanks a bunch. <laughs> uh, Robert Peston there. You can catch up on iPlayer if you want. <laughs> the basic trouble is we're all living too long. Yes. Mm. As they just found out, much to everyone's surprise, uh, well, there's not much we can do about that. Oh, I don't know. We could all move to East Glasgow. <laughs> and we died 53. <laughs> You mean, if I was living in Glasgow, I'd have already been dead for 19 years? Yes, yes, Gordon Brown would love that. Yes. He'd be beside himself. Beside himself. Uh, you mark my words, it won't be long before you see government campaigns to promote unhealthy lifestyles. Really? Yes. And certainly. Uh, ring NHS Direct for advice on taking up smoking again. <laughs> Obesity clubs. Eat until you can't walk. <laughs> the, trouble, the trouble with those things is they take too long to have any effect. I mean, the pension crisis is here today. No, that's far too negative an attitude for this government. Yes. They'll come up with subsidised free-fall parachute jumping for the over-70s. <laughs> Anything dangerous. Things to do before you die. Yes. <laughs> Or while you die. Or while you die. <laughs> that would get the pension uh, population down a bit, yes, wouldn't it? Yes, roof jumping, whatever that thing's called. Formula mm. One motor racing. Ah, well, Audrey would go in for that, wouldn't she? Oh, yes, very much so. Very yes. much. She was done for speeding in 1972. <laughs> so. It would be a bit tricky, though, getting her into Formula One at this stage yes, in her yes, life. Yes, it would. It would. It'd be quite tricky, actually, getting her into the car. I mean, <laughs> much of her would be overflowing the cockpit. <laughs> And the aerodynamic properties would go by the ball. Very, very much, yes. I, I think the only parts of Formula One she could manage would be the orgies. <laughs> orgies? Yeah, you know, Max Mosley has these orgies. I mean, geez, <laughs> even then she might find herself a bit out of breath. <laughs> well, it's not too late. You should map out a strategy. First thing... Get a job. Well, who's going to give me a job at my age? Well, there's B and Q. <laughs> I mean, they have a policy where they take on clapped out old people. Yeah. So there you are. Join B and Q, start selling lawnmowers or whatever it is, work your way up, get a seat on the board, do something which nearly ruins them, and then stand by for the big payoff. <laughs> <laughs> Bit of a tall order, isn't it? I'm not sure I've got enough time left to do all that. Well, um, what about uh, football? Football? Yeah. You could become a, a Premier League manager, and then all you have to do is lose three matches in a row, and you get the sack and five million quid. Yeah. <laughs> That's it's quite an easy job from what I've seen on television. I mean, you just run up and down the touchline, and occasionally shout things like, Oi, Wazza, get tighter! 
<laughs> and you can ask Mr. Patel for advice on the finer points. He has a football uh, background. But Mr. Patel at the village shop? Well, of course, Mr. Patel at the village shop. How many Mr. Patel?